very interesting and fascinating, I'm sure, and there are plenty of questions. Please recognize yourself when you ask a question. We'll start from there. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, concerned by, by about some of the things you said, obviously, because you seem to indicate Jeff, what... Um, identify yourself. Oh, uh, I'm Jeffrey Bale, uh, expert on terrorism, political and religious extremism. So this is really the focus of my question is going to be. On the one hand, it seems like there's a lot of problems with this field because everything's in the private sector. There's insufficient oversight. People are buying things all over in foreign countries, and it's relatively cheap technology and so forth and so on. But it's not clear to me. Let's say you were in the fireiest non-state actor. Let's say you were a political religious extremist who wanted to carry out some kind of new and devastating attack or something like that on your, your designated enemies. Um, it's not clear to me how, how this would actually be operationalized. I mean, uh, on the one hand, you said that on lower level things, you don't have to have much scientific knowledge, but obviously to do the higher levels, more sophisticated types of, um, uh, 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 of DNA modification, it would require much higher level of scientific expertise. So I guess my question is, I mean, maybe this is something you can't really answer, because maybe nobody can answer it, but I mean, to what extent do you think that, that you can could, you could envision a scenario where a particular political or religious extremist group could use this technology to, to, to an operational way to carry out a successful attack? And what, what kind of uh, uh, capabilities would such a group need to have in order to do that? Right, okay. So that's actually exactly one of the scenarios that we, we looked at, um, and we call it the Bioterrorism 2.0, uh, which was looking at how a group um, could use um, uh, CRISPR to uh, uh, modify a strain of E. coli that normally causes food poisoning, but adjust the, um, uh, the, the biochemical pathway to, to boost its production of, of the toxin it normally produces. So there, there's a, a Shiga strain of, of E. coli that does, causes food poisoning by producing toxin, if, in, but um, if you could increase the, its toxin producing abilities, disseminate that in a salad bar or in a, you know, a restaurant, that would produce a much more severe reaction, and, but in a way that would be kind of clandestine and not easily traced back to the group, right? So combination of the Russian Ishis from, you know, 84, but a, a high biotech version of that. Mm -hmm. um, and in our scenario, right, that was done by a group that had purposely recruited um, PhDs and postdocs who were disgruntled, um, as unfortunately many of them are. Um, <laughs> and, and so it was, it was using people who had that skill already. Um, and finding uh, folks who were already had some of that skill and knowledge, and then giving that motivation to let's let's use this to attack our you know our enemy. And in our case, it was kind of a white supremacist group that had this this motivation to, to do this. Um, so um, uh, you know, so this is also highlighting kind of the insider risk and insider threat. Is that it's not that you're going to have a group of you know amateurs that were going to train themselves on, on how to do this, and this will be their their chosen mo. But um, given that there is this kind of growing access to the technology and the skill set is widely distributed, and this is becoming much more commonplace in, you know, in, in all sorts of you know, academia, private sector, you know, community labs, um, you know, the, the risk that some of those folks might be radicalized, or, and it maybe it will be purely for personal reasons, like you know, kind of Bruce Ivins type of thing, or you know, they are actually radicalized by some outside group, that potential is there. Right. And you know, will this be the first thing that a group goes to? You know, probably, probably not. Uh, but to the extent that they are, uh, and, and also to the extent that we've done a good job in terms of um, the select agent regulations and, and locking up the most dangerous pathogens that are out there, right? It would be really hard to go to a lab and, and try and acquire anthrax or tularemia. Um, but if you can take a non-pathogenic organism or a naturally occurring strain of something like E. coli and just make it worse, right? That way you could do that outside of the current regulatory biosecurity framework. So that's why we saw that as a vulnerability. And again, as was brought up, the, um, the, the companies that sell these plasmids and these vectors, they don't do any kind of customer screening uh, at all. So um, that raises- It's not encouraging. I'm more of at least one company that does screen customers, but it's just one. And there are a lot of people <laughs> in this marketplace that do that. So, yeah, so that, one of our recommendations was that industry needs to kind of adopt some best practices and, and do some better screening uh, because they are, you know, potentially vulnerable to being, you know, misused in that way. Thank you. Please. Thanks. Uh, I'm Graham McIntyre. I'm, I'm a candidate here for also Canadian diplomat on leave. Um, very interesting and worrying presentation. Thank you very much for doing us more nightmares. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I was really interested in, in just the parts of your, your talk that focused on, you know, the kind of 
Um, I, I guess decreasing sophistication perhaps is the way to describe it, it's required, or it's a bit related to that question that just posed about how much you know, uh, knowledge or, or expertise is really required, and is that, um, you know, even if it's at currently at a fairly high level, is that line declining? Is it getting easier and easier, or will it get easier and easier for, for less and less sophisticated people to, to get hold of this sort of equipment uh, and technology, and, um, you know, brainstorm and come up with, with lots of nasty beasties, whether they're bacteria or, or you know, genetic you know, modifications to, to humans. Um, and then related to that, um, um, also the question of whether um, you think that it's, I, I guess these are you know, probably rather speculative questions, but um, you think that, that the um, type of, of ethical questions that are going on right now in the US and other Western countries uh, in, in the scientific community are being explored as rigorously in, in other you know, parts of the world. You know, if, if the restraints are, are you know, perhaps as high or, or higher or more worrying or lower. Okay. Yeah, okay, both, both good questions. Uh, and the first question really is one of the main issues that people are trying to tackle in this field, right? How, how much easier does this technology make the, uh, or how much skill is, is uh, reduced in, in the, the ability to utilize this technology effectively? Um, my colleague, George Mason, Sonia Benoit Gormley, who some of you might, might know since she used to be at CNS, she actually has a grant to do study exactly that question. And she's going to be going into labs, uh, CRISPR labs around the world, interviewing scientists to understand how that um, increasing level of, of uh, uh, to what extent there is a correlation between the accessibility of this technology and the reduced skills needed to, to use it. And there's issues about tacit knowledge, expertise. Um, you know, as a general matter, um, I, I think it's um, the, the trend is definitely towards the um, less skill being required to use this. And in part, um, I, 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 you know, I have students who do this in, in labs, who've done this in community labs. Um, uh, there is also a, if you look at also the, the, the literature about um, how much this, this um, technology has been used. There's been some research that shows that this technology, the experiments and research done with, with CRISPR is easily replicated by other labs. So um, there's a problem in science with reproducibility and certain you know, reagents or certain things only work under very specific conditions and other labs just can't replicate the result. That's not the problem with, with CRISPR, right? Once people work, you know, it makes, they make it work, they upload their plasmid to adgene, someone else buys that plasmid and they're able to do the exact same experiment uh, on their own. So that shows that there's a transferability that you don't need to be you know, hyper-specialized and only get that expertise in the lab. This is something more generalizable uh, you know, uh, type of, of knowledge that, that's needed. Again, there's still that underlying fundamental knowledge about the, the genome that you are trying to edit. And so that I think that is an irreducible um, uh, barrier, right? That you cannot, um, you know, again, it, it's like learning another language. Um, and so that is, I think, fundamental. But the tool itself is increasingly usable if you have that, that basic knowledge. On the ethics, um, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I don't think the U.S. is doing a good job at this point. Um, I don't think internationally it's being done very well. Um, when we had, so, so uh, Dr. Uh, Jin Kuo uh, came out at this, this second um, Gene Summit meeting, um, and the, the statement that they put out at the second meeting did not call for moratorium on germline editing. Uh, did not even say, here are the conditions under which this is acceptable. They said, here are the principles that we'd like to see you follow if you do determine human germline editing. It, was, it wasn't giving a green light, but it was very permissive. And um, there's now a big debate about whether there should be a moratorium or not, and, and some, you know, there's arguments on, on both sides of it. Um, but I, I think there is a lot of, I mean, I think people have stars in their eyes about what this technology can do, right? And, and you know, and you, you, you could use it to eradicate certain genetic disorders that are located in just one gene. So that is a huge potential benefit. Plus, there are dollar signs in people's eyes. And, and there's a lot of money to be made. And, um, and I think that there's a, you know, so there's incentive for people to put the ethics to the side and, and let's just get the technology perfected. Uh, but of course, at that point, when they say, okay, the technology is safe, we can do it. At that point, well, you know, it's too late to bring ethics in because then you, you have a ready-made, um, you know, product, and it would be you know, unethical not to treat people who have this disorder or have this, you know, this condition. So, um, you know, the fact that we're having conversation is a good thing in the U.S., uh, in, in China, uh, in, in Europe. Um, there's a slightly different conversation going on in countries uh, like in, in, in Africa, for example, 
where um, they're looking at how do you use gene drives to eradicate uh, uh, mosquitoes that carry malaria, which is the single largest killer in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, some countries are very opposed to using genetically modified and gene edited organisms. Other ones, others are very you know, interested in, in can we make this happen? And so they can, like, the ethics is, well, would it be unethical not to do this, right? If we could eradicate this mosquito vector that causes you know, millions of, of deaths and, and countless you know, fields, right? Shouldn't we be doing this? Um, and so, right, that gets uh, into a, and then on top of that, well, if we're eradicating entire species, right, are we as humans allowed to do that? Can we just go around eradicating species deliberately? Um, and so, um, uh, you know, there there is some good work being done by certain individuals on that, but I would say internationally not good, and and in a lot of countries, unfortunately, I think there are other priorities that are getting in the way of, of a really clear ethical discussion on, on some of these things. Uh, Abner and then I'll, I'll Do you see the potential of weaponizing it into, into some sort of assassination weapons? In other words, something that could be used not just by terrorists, but even by you know, secret organization of government to, to, to take actions against enemies inside or outside of any of that. So that was also a scenario that we, we looked at in the, the covert bioweapons scenario uh, up, in, up in the corner there. And uh, you know, clearly inspired by the, um, the, the, the Scripple attack with Novichok agent by the assassination of Kim Jong-nam with VX in, in Malaysia. Um, but there's a long history of, of governments seeking clandestine means of either assassination or incapacitation. And, in order, and being able to do so in a way that looks naturally occurring and therefore has plausible deniability is certainly very attractive to authoritarian regimes today. And I think that um, you know, the behavior of the North Koreans and the Russians show that there is definitely a very strong demand signal from certain types of governments that they would like to be able to do that if they could. Well, Israel, they live in Dubai. <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah, this, this is, um, uh, this is a, a, a widespread uh, problem. Um, uh, and and, and th there is definitely uh, potential for that, and what we looked at in, in this case was uh, a um, you know a, a, a fictitious you know government leader who wanted to basically neutralize a, a dissident who had defected who was going to cause a kind of international crisis, and they needed to eliminate that defector without causing another international crisis. And uh, having seen the way that VX and Novichok backfired on the Russian North Koreans, they looked at how to use um, a, a, a modified gene therapy vector in order to induce a kind of catastrophic neurological disorder on this individual that would look like you know, a naturally occurring event and would not have any of the signatures related to a known pathogen or known chemical or toxin and therefore could not be traced back to the sponsor. So, um, I mean, that... So you think it's, it's feasible? It, it's plausible, right? And again, our scenarios are all uh, plausible but not possible. Right, because we were not wanting to talk about specific things that, that you could do, but based on what we've seen, how governments have looked at advanced chemical and biological technologies in the past and what they want to use them for, um, this certainly falls into that category of uh, a, 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 providing a tool that we have seen governments want to use in the past. And so this would be the, the newest iteration of, of how they could how they could do so. Thank you, um, Philip. So sort of. Two questions, actually, one directly related to that. So today, very few countries are thought to have biological weapons programs. North Korea is obviously one of the exceptions to that. We think they have fairly robust efforts. What's your guess now, right now, about the degree to which they are pursuing CRISPR-Cas9 sort of avenues? And to what extent does CRISPR-Cas9, for you, today, change your threat assessment about potential North Korean biological weapons capabilities? I mean, one, there's sort of two things, right? One is sort of today and one is down the road, but I'm still kind of grappling with that question of like right now for a fairly well-financed, fairly sophisticated actor like North Korea, you know, to what extent is this actually a game changer? And the second question is, so you're someone with a political science background who's working on this deeply technical field, like not even just at the intersection, but you're like actually working on a technical policy problem. And that's the kind of thing that many of us to a degree do here, right? A lot of us have policy political science backgrounds, and yet we kind of work at this intersection. So I would love to hear you reflect a little bit about sort of what that's like and like how you think about what your limitations are, how you engage with technical colleagues. Like how do you, as this person with this political science background, you're sort of deeply involved in this highly technical field and speak to it in a very facile, in a very substantive way. Authority word. 
What's that? A yeah, third that you win. So, so on, on the first question, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't really raise concern for me about North Korea, mm -hmm. per se. Um, uh, I mean, it, knowing that we know extremely little about what they are actually doing in, the, in this field, um, I, um, you know, I, I, I would still be much worried about them working with smallpox mm -hmm. than anything that in, in, this, in this space. The country I am worried about in this context though is Russia, because mm -hmm. uh, we know Russia does have an offensive program that has you know survived the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. um, and we know they've also talked publicly about genetic mm -hmm. weapons, which yeah. is unclear what that means exactly. But if and we know they also you know uh, you know thanks to the work of, of Ray and, and Lightenberg, we, we know just how much they're trying to use uh, genetic engineering back in the 1970s and 80s to develop and improve biological weapons. Since that program has not gone away. I would assume that the same people who are doing that or their, their successors will be looking at this technology as the next frontier for how do we develop new and improved biological weapons. And maybe they are for strategic purposes like they were in the Cold War, or maybe they are for more assassination purposes like we see in the case of uh, the, the Novichok uh, poisoning. Um, so I, I, I see Russia as the kind of country with both the capability and the intent to use this technology for malicious purposes. And um, again, I have no evidence of that, but. I, there's enough circumstantial evidence that that would be my, my top concern. You're less concerned about the North Koreans because they're a less sophisticated actor? So today this is more of a down the road than a near term? Uh, right, more, yeah, less sophisticated, um, again, and, and don't have the, um, necessarily the, the, the background that they have an interest in this kind of, this level of application, right? Just for them having anthrax and smallpox might be sufficient for their, what they perceive their strategic needs to be. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, but you know, but I think Russia is a different a different case in, in point. On the kind of intersection of, of the science, technology, and policy, um, I mean, it's a challenge. I mean, this 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 was a I we had to do a, a very deep dive on this, and um, it was fascinating. Um, and I was very lucky to have colleagues um, at, at Stanford who were well versed in, in the science and technology to kind of help along. But at the end of the day, you really need to kind of get inside the technology first and then figure out, okay, now how does this have implications outside? So there's a very steep learning process uh, in this. And again, that's why we had these issue briefs uh, as part of the, the process, which was partly to bring in certain experts from, from industry and from academia to, to do this, but also right, we worked on these issue briefs as well. And so it was also our way of educating ourselves about uh, the science and technology. Of Maybe you could say a few words about the process. How did you actually produce those? How it Progress. How did you do the work? Sure. So, um, uh, so th this was about a, a two-year um, long um, uh, program, um, and we had the, the core team. We then collected around ourselves the um, you know a, a dozen or so um, uh, participants. We held three workshops, um, uh, and. Uh, for the workshops, we had, uh, identified um, you know, uh, five people who were going to write, uh, write issue briefs on a particular uh, topic. So, um, uh, for example, Sarah Carter um, uh, wrote uh, an issue brief for us about um, kind of agricultural and industrial applications of, of uh, CRISPR and, and genome editing, and looking at you know, how this technology could be used in these, in these fields. Um, <coughs> Uh, Kevin Esfeld, uh, who's at MIT and it basically invented gene drives, wrote uh, an issue for us about gene drives and how they could be the, the, um, misused and the obstacles to, to misusing gene drives and what you could do to detect and respond, respond to them. Um, and so in the workshop, they would present, and they also had each uh, issue brief author had a discussant who was paired with them to provide kind of a, a counterpoint uh, to them. Um, and so at, they would present these papers at, at the workshops, and the entire group would then discuss the, the issues that were being were being raised and so we kind of had you know, two iterations of this so by the time that we were ready to come out with the final paper we had these five issue briefs that dealt with uh, you know a, a background on, on kind of CRISPR genome editing in general that was written by uh, um, a, a young British scientist who worked for a company that, that did genome editing for kind of for, for a living um, Sarah Carter who was looking at the bioeconomy uh, Kevin Esfeld looking at gene drives uh, Kyle Waters, who works in Jennifer Downer's lab at Berkeley, uh, and so he is a, a practicing CRISPR scientist, uh, wrote a uh, issue brief for us about um, how CRISPR we use on, uh, for global health security purposes, right, for developing new detection and diagnostic systems, new medical countermeasures, 
uh, facilitating research on the genomics of these pathogens and, and how to, to defeat them. Um, and then we had a couple of, um, uh, and then um, Sonia and Kathleen Vogel wrote uh, a piece for us tackling more the tacit knowledge issue and looking at to what extent is this technology reducing barriers to, to misuse or, or to use uh, and, and to what extent is tacit knowledge still this, this fundamental barrier to, to all these, these applications. Um, and so right, this was a kind of a collective body of, of very deep knowledge that we were able to, to draw upon. Uh, but we're going to do so after kind of educating ourselves and thinking also for myself and, and Jessica Patrick, who's the other PI from, from Mason, we both have more kind of national security background. So thinking about this from that, you know, given the technology, what could this uh, implications have for the security <laughs> world and security policy? Um, uh, and so, uh, and then of course, by the end of the project, um, Right, we had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jean Quao come out with the, uh, the, the CRISPR babies, which kind of changed the, the flavor of things uh, overall. But, uh, um, and you have the names of all of you as the authors? Well, so, we, so the, the main report was, was authored by the, the, main, um, the, the main team, uh, along with um, two other folks, Eddie Perello and, and Sarah Denton, who did a lot of research for this. And then the issue briefs are authored under the names of the people who, who wrote them. Um, and then in all the reports, we have credit for all the people who are part of the workshop and, and, and whatnot. And the workshop were held at Mason and held at Stanford, and we were able to draw each time. The Mason workshop, we had some extra kind of government officials come in and former government officials come in and in D.C. And then the Stanford workshop, um, we had people from um, the ethics and, and the biology programs at Stanford who were not part of the, the regular team, but they, you know, so Gerendi, Matthew Porteous, you know, were leading figures in their fields were able to come in and sit in on the workshop. And participate, even though they were not, you know, a, a formal part of the actual um, uh, study project. Uh, so again, we were able to try to purposely reach out to a lot of different experts in a lot of different areas in order to, to get the right perspectives. But at the end of the day, that the final report is is by you know is, is by the authors, and any errors or mistakes are by the five other people on there, not not me. Mm -hmm. but, um, I will give the floor to Bill and to you, and probably we'll close the questions. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. <coughs> thank you. Uh, given me a, a number of uh, additional reasons why I find it hard to sleep. Uh, uh, and I think it's very important that kind of the issues that you've shared with us. And I, I also appreciate that having raised all of these complex issues, um, that it's very difficult to point us in a direction about how to manage some of the problems. But it would be helpful because I assume your group also paid some attention to what might be done to at least mitigate uh, some of these threats, if you could share with us, at least in rather broad strokes, uh, things that we might do uh, to, in fact, uh, attempt to mitigate some of the the worst outcomes that you've identified in your in your uh, report. Right. So, um, you know, partly, you know, we had to recognize that genome editing is, is a very fast-moving field, uh, and there were um, developments that occurred. Um, during the course of our project that just were not even in existence when, when we started. Um, and so um, one of the kind of the key issues we identified was that there needs to be a dynamic process for engaging all the diverse stakeholders in this field in order to develop a kind of a common understanding of the nature of these different kinds of risks um, in general. So it, there are some specific policy recommendations we have in there, but a lot of it was really we need to build a process in order to bring together these people, in order to think and, and talk through these these problems in a more systematic way, um, and the you know international gene editing summit that um, you know that, that happened was a good example of that for that very specific narrow narrow topic. Um, but again, because there are uh, research being done in the fields of immunology and gene therapy and cancer therapy that, that touch on these things, and a lot of this being done in the private sector, there needs to be a much more robust. Process and form for, for doing this, right? So we have to talk about the strategies for collaboration among these different stakeholders and how to bring them together in ways that um, they can identify the right options. And, and you know, we had some specific uh, you know recommendations, um, but um, we realized that you know they, these things need to be kind of organic and, and have buy-in from from the stakeholders. Um, I mean, for example, one of the um, you know in areas of biosafety, for example. Um, the, the fact that the only standard out there now is this voluntary standard that a handful of scientists put together themselves right, is just not sufficient. Right? There needs to be a much more robust binding uh, um, a standard 
for people who are doing research with gene with gene drives that need to be subject to much kind of higher code standards of, of biosafety. Code of conduct. Yeah, but what's now is a code of conduct. And, and some people just have said, I'm just not going to agree to it. I, there need to be actual policy. So for example, if NIH, NSF, other funders said, if you are going to receive funding for this, here, is, here are the standards you need to meet. Right? That would be, we need to have some kind of teeth behind these best practices to make them actually implemented across, across the board. Um, uh, and, and so, so like that. Uh, I, I talked before about the fact that the private sector is exempt currently from, from U.S. government do, do research oversight. I think that needs to change. Um, uh, I, I think there's just way too much activity that is moving into the dual use sphere in, in the private sector now to, to allow that to happen totally without any sort of supervision or, or even awareness. Um, uh, but again, that, I mean, but implementing that would require a, you know, a lengthy process to engage with the stakeholders, which is why we want kind of a collaborative process to kind of uh, get these things uh, uh, underway. At the same time, right, and, and as the International Gene Editing Summit showed, right, collaboration doesn't always work. There are rogue actors. There are governments that are not going to want to um, you know, play by these rules. Uh, and so we need to use the fact that gene editing is this incredibly versatile platform and there's lots of innovation going on. We need to harness that as part of the strategy of resilience and prepare for cases where this stuff is either released by accident or someone is deliberately misusing the, the technology. Um, and so um, there are different um, ways to, you can devise detection systems to detect gene drives in the wild that we should be developing that in case one of these laboratories doesn't follow the rules or there's a human error or whatever happens, we are prepared to um, go out into the wild in the community around that lab and make sure that the gene drive is not now you know, in, in, uh, interfering with the ecosystem. Right now, there's just, we just don't have anything to do that. Um, uh, um, to the extent that we need to be able to um, detect um, when um, you know uh, uh, where vectors are, are coming from, right? The kind of the forensics attribution that go along with tracing back, you know, CRISPR payloads or vectors to their source would be useful, right? In order to prevent that situation where you have a rogue state or rogue actors, you know, using this as a way of, of you know attacking individuals. Um, we, we want to have some way of doing the, the forensics to trace this back. Um, so again, there needs to be kind of innovation for the purpose, not just of innovation, but for the purpose of preparing for uh, you know, the, these negative outcomes as a way of either as a deterrent you know, in, in the, kind of the government sense or as a way of you know, mitigation um, and, and attribution afterwards. So um, in, in the report, we do talk about the, these twin strategies of collaboration on the one hand to prevent misuse but then also what we need to prepare for if misuse happens, what do we need to have some of the basic kind of building blocks we need to have in place in order to make sure the consequences aren't you know, as, as bad as they can be. Okay, last question. Right. I just had a really quick question. Sure. I'm, I'm a student here in the dual degree program and I'm, um, I study biology in undergrad, so I'm really interested in policy and biosecurity. Um, you had talked about engaging different stakeholders to kind of come up with policy solutions, but you never mentioned the role of scholarly journals and people that actually publish this research. And I'm interested in what you think their role should be in kind of as the gatekeepers of what gets into the journals and what becomes available freely searchable online. And to give you a concrete example, there was a paper that was published last year where in a couple of researchers in the course of looking at a vaccine for smallpox were able to reconstruct an infectious synthetic chimera of horsepox, which is a near relative. And that caused a little bit of controversy over whether their method section should be available online and searchable in case somebody wanted to replicate that. So. Okay, great, great question. Um, so yeah, so, so the, the publishers can play a, a, a huge role in this, in this process. Um, and, um, and they've done a little bit of that for, for biosecurity and dual use in, in general. But um, again, those are mostly kind of the microbiology journals where people are published on select agents and anthrax and tutorium, and they've been sensitized to this. The journals that specialize in CRISPR, uh, specialize in um, you know, functional development, right? they, they don't, again, they don't even know that they should be worried about this. Um, and, and so we would want to be able to expand that, um, uh, the list of journals that do have a process in place. And you know, there's a box that a, science, you know, that a uh, submitter has to check that, you know, you know, does your research have any duty implications such as, right, if, if yes, check here, okay, we need to now have a discussion and see if um, we need to do things with your paper to make sure that you're not going to be creating information hazards or revealing vulnerability. So 
Um, publishers definitely can play a big role, and, and the problem now is that the journals that are big in this field just are not even aware that this is an issue that they need to be thinking about. And um, the, the horse box case is near and dear to my heart. I've written uh, several articles on that uh, specifically, and um, that is a case where the publisher did have a process in place, um, and they decided to publish anyways. And, uh, and they, the way they did it was very opaque, and I don't think very credible. And, and that's part of the, the problem is that um, you know, assessing both the benefits and risks of this technology is, it, it is still a very subjective process. Um, it is still very intangible. You cannot quantify and say there's five units of risk and six units of benefit, therefore I'll, I'll publish. It, it, it's, it's, you know, it, there, there's a lot more kind of judgment that goes into it. That particular case, I think, was very clear to me that this was research that should not have been done, it should not have been published the way it was. Um, and I had actually talked to the journal about that ahead of time and afterwards. Um, but um, right, this is this is why it's a dual use dilemma. There is no easy solution to it, and why it's this constant struggle to uh, try and devise governance uh, uh, measures that will, um, you know, create opportunities for that kind of intervention to try and, and prevent it. Um, but recognizing that, you know, at the end of the day, because this technology is so distributed, because the oversight is still fairly lax and patchy, that there's just lots of opportunity for people to do things that are, you know, do raise risks. So maybe it's not, you know, catastrophic risk, but it, it definitely does advance our knowledge But how do you want to, you know, how do you, if you want to synthesize smallpox, you know, knowing how to synthesize horsepox gives you a huge advantage and, and makes you that one step closer to be able to realize that, that objective. So uh, raise, that raises a lot of concerns for me. And if anyone here is in my class this weekend, we were going to spend a whole module talking about horsepox uh, synthesis. So uh, get ready for that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Do have, what time do we usually end? Well, let me tell you the next question. One, one question. Um, uh, my name is Tom. I'm a master student here. Um, with recent advances in things like additive manufacturing, we've seen things like the computer where you can effectively print your own pharmaceuticals. Do you think in the future there would be some crazy scenario where you could walk in your basement and print off by a weapon? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're. we're I, it's not that far in the future, so there are actually now um, fully automated DNA printers that if you have the uh, genetic sequence of a virus that is not too big uh, and you uh, um, have the right um, reagents, that there, there are, um, uh, you know, that there are automated DNA processors that can uh, convert that digital sequence into live infectious virus. Um, so that is kind of reality. Now, if those things are really expensive, and the good news is the companies that, there's only one company that builds that kind of device right now, and they're part of a consortium called the uh, International Gene Synthesis Consortium, that they do customer screening. They do sequence screening. So they do check that anyone who wants to order a sequence from them, uh, they check and make sure that they're a legit user, and they check that sequence against a list of known uh, you know, threat agent sequences to make sure that people aren't trying to synthesize you know, smallpox or anthrax or, or whatnot. Um, but, um, you know, Who's to say that another company won't, you know, create the exact same device and not be part of that consortium and not have the same safeguards? Um, so that that's not just science fiction. That that's you know much closer than, than we think. I'm not happy note. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. That was very.